Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named Girl From Nowhere, Season 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first episode begins with a mysterious girl introducing herself. Her name is Nano, with a face full of youthful vitality that seems to set the boys in class abuzz. One boy, pushing away the ugly classmate sitting next to him, hopes to have Nano sit by his side. This boy is named Nike, a student from a rich family, and despite his bad reputation, many girls in school wish to be his girlfriend. The chubby teacher has arranged other seating, and the girl sitting next to Nano greets her warmly. She advises Nano to stay away from Nike, who has already caused several girls at school to become pregnant. However, the school turns a blind eye to Nike's actions because of his good grades, and even plans to make him the next student council president. Upon hearing this, Nano's face breaks into a knowing smile. She quips that as long as she doesn't get pregnant, it's all good. Hearing this, the girl looks at her with a sense of unease. The scene shifts, and Nano is now sitting with the playboy Nike, sharing a meal rather intimately. Nike's sidekick tactfully leaves them alone and joins two other female classmates instead. The sidekick has a hobby of making bets on how quickly Nike can win over a girl, and this time is no exception. As the betting pool opens, the whole class eagerly places their bets. That day, a girl, visibly pregnant, steps out from the restroom and looks at Nano with a sense of pity. She reveals to Nano the betting game the classmates are playing. The girl is one of Nike's victims and doesn't want to see others suffer the same fate. Nano listens to the girl's advice but then coldly asks how long it took her to end up in bed with Nike. Annoyed, the girl turns and leaves. In the next scene, Nano and Nike are in the school's storage room, wrestling their muscles. Nano tells Nike to wait. Nike thought he might not succeed with Nano today, but she simply asks him to wait a minute. After a minute, Nano takes the lead and crouches down on the ground. Back in class, Nike boasts to his sidekick that it took him three days, three hours, and 33 minutes to win over Nano, and the results are in. The sidekick begins to settle the betting pool as the classmates gather around to see whose guess was closest. Suddenly, Nano appears, causing some panic among the students. However, Nano doesn't seem to mind at all and happily sits on a desk, casually picking up a betting slip that reads three days, which is close but not correct. The sidekick picks up another slip and reads the time written on it. It's exactly three days, three hours, and 33 minutes. To everyone's shock, the name on the slip is Nano's. Nano collects all the money, and before leaving, she mocks Nike, revealing that she's the real player. Fuming, Nike runs to the restroom to cool off. Nano passes by with an even more mocking look. That day, Nike scores with another girl, but as they're about to get intimate, the girl screams in a chicken voice and runs away like a chicken. Looking down, Nike notices his belly has grown. Thinking it's just bloating, he clutches his stomach and heads home. After taking a bite of the food his mother hands him, he vomits on the table. Despite feeling unwell the next day, Nike doesn't give up and goes after another pretty girl. The same plot unfolds and he ends up at the hospital. The doctor looks puzzled and asks Nike if he has transitioned because he's pregnant. It's 15 weeks along, despite Nike being male. Nike doesn't believe it, but the reality is undeniable, and he can even feel the little one moving inside him. The doctor tells him the baby is a girl, and Nike's nightmare begins. Back at school, Nike runs out of the classroom in despair, and the sidekick chases after him, assuring Nike he can share any troubles with him. Nike reveals his pregnancy, only to turn around and find Nano recording a video. The video of his conversation with his sidekick spreads across the campus. The once-admired star has now fallen, pushed by the crowd. Heartbroken, Nike reflects on his past wrongdoings. It was all because he never took precautions. The things that happened to those girls are now happening to him, and he has no idea what to do with his pregnancy. Returning home, Nike locks himself in his room. His father, having heard the news of his son's pregnancy, comes back and berates him furiously. The father has paid a high price for Nike's future, and his reprimands enrage Nike, who retorts that his father is no better, impregnating his secretary, and so he has no right to blame him. It's a case of like father, like son. Having lost the care of friends and family, Nike moves out on his own. Every day in the dimly lit room, Nike forces down the unpalatable fast food, often vomiting as he eats. He looks in the mirror at his worn-out reflection in the belly that keeps growing. Shaking, Nike takes out a pill intending to get rid of the baby, but vomits as soon as he swallows the medicine. Desperate for it to have an effect, he crams handfuls of pills into his mouth. 
Due to the side effects, Nike starts coughing up blood and writhes in pain on the floor. After a long time, Nike, who had passed out from the pain, awakens to see his stomach still distended. He picks up a knife from the table. There's a knock at the door, but upon opening it, there's no one there. Just a small note with two lines, asking him if he knew how he got pregnant and who was the last woman before he got pregnant. Afterward, Nike, donning a wig and a mask, confronts Nano, demanding to know what she did to him. Nano simply responds that it was just a bit of fun, echoing words Nike used to say. As the sun sets, a lonely Nike, dressed in maternity clothes, walks the streets with his prominent belly. He meets a girl who is also pregnant, someone he recognizes because he's the one who impregnated her. Nike, with tears streaming, apologizes to the girl, who graciously accepts. They hold hands and embrace tightly, but without a hormone yoga this time. The girl forgives Nike, but has no intention of getting back together with him. Later, the girl is in labor, and after a moment of intense pain, she gives birth to a baby. Her face glows with the radiant smile of a mother. Meanwhile, Nike lies on an operating table, having paid the doctor to remove the child within. However, upon waking, the doctor hands him a baby, saying they couldn't harm the child and they can just help deliver it. Desperate, Nike returns to his gloomy room next to the crying baby. At that moment, there's a knock on the door. It's Nano coming to see the child. Nike earnestly promises Nano to change his ways, hoping she'll get back with him to co-parent. Nano bluntly rejects him, dropping a bag of mother and baby supplies on the floor before closing the door. Then a terrifying scene unfolds. Nano picks up a photo. It's her own face scribbled over. They're all over the floor. Following these photos, Nano walks to the rooftop where there's a photo from her recent conversation with Nike, but her face is scratched out. On the rooftop in blood-red letters, it says, See you soon. The second episode begins with a young couple whispering sweet nothings across a garden wall when suddenly the girl hurries off, narrowly escaping being caught red-handed by an approaching teacher. From the window above, Nano watches the scene unfold and poses a question. Why do teachers and adults prohibit young love among students? Cut to a scene of an all-girls school, where the strict school rules dictate the students' dress code and even their posture during prayers. The intent is to cultivate proper ladies. In the principal's office, a heated argument ensues between Miss Naromon and the principal. The principal is considering merging the boys' and girls' schools due to financial constraints, a move that traditionalist Miss Naromon vehemently opposes, arguing that the boys would corrupt the girls. Upon hearing the principal's reasoning that the school can't afford to pay salaries without the merger, Miss Narumon pulls out a love letter from a boy at the boys' school. The principal, unfazed and holding the final say, dismisses her concerns. Frustrated, Miss Naruemon shares the principal's decision with the other teachers, only to be met with indifferent reactions. This apathy incites Miss Naruemon's resolve to protect the purity of the girls' school, and eventually, she finds an ally in the assistant teacher. Together, they begin to devise a plan to prevent premature romances among the students. Meanwhile, Nano has spread the news of the school merger among her classmates, causing a ripple of anxiety since the teachers have often instilled in them the idea that men are untrustworthy. As Nano tries to explain the situation, a complexity in a shy girl's expression catches her eye. The day of the school merger arrives, and excitement buzzes in the air. Nano takes on the role of a social butterfly, helping students mingle. She even pulls the shy classmate into the fray, encouraging her to introduce the boys to the school. One of the male students can hardly take his eyes off the shy classmate. Nano's sociable behavior is seen as a positive trait by some, but not by others. In the background, the assistant teacher covertly takes a photo of Nano fostering interactions among the students and hands it to Miss Naruamon. Upon viewing the photo, a look of murderous intent flashes in Miss Naruamon's eyes. The scene shifts to the schoolyard, where Miss Naruamon gathers the students to announce the new rules she has implemented. She decrees that boys and girls must maintain a distance and forbids them from engaging in social relationships. She even segregates the classes by gender to reduce interactions between male and female students. But school rules are just the beginning. Miss Narumon's main focus is on sports. She demands that the boys engage in rigorous physical exercise daily to push their endurance to the limit. As a result, the boys are too exhausted to chat with the girls, let alone hormone interaction and date. In the cafeteria, Miss Naruemon further orders the ban of chocolates and beverages, considering them items reserved for dating. The female students, eating their meals, feel sorry for the boys but are powerless to help. That's when Nano comes up with an idea. She whips out her phone and creates a group chat, inviting all her classmates to join. 
The chat is lively and joyful, and Nano even tosses a bottle of milk to one of the boys. However, it doesn't take long before the existence of the group chat is discovered. Although the content of the messages is innocent, Miss Naruemon interprets even the punctuation as indecent. She suspects that Nano's act of giving milk to the boys has a more profound implication. Consequently, a new rule is introduced, no communication between boys and girls by any means, and mobile internet use is suspended. The students are left feeling frustrated and powerless. In the evening, Miss Naruemon holds a photograph, and memories flood back to when she was a young girl, sharing her dreams with her best friend about teaching and contributing to her alma mater. Since then, new school rules have continuously emerged, forbidding students from showing any signs of affection, even platonic friendship. But Nano, ever resourceful, finds a new app that allows for anonymous chatting, undetectable by the teachers. The students go wild with excitement, engrossed in the app. It's not long before Nano is summoned to the office, accused of recommending an inappropriate app to her classmates. Unperturbed by the accusation, Nano retorts by asking her if she ever had a romance during her student days. Miss Narumon dodges the question, insisting that early romances lead to the loss of a girl's purity and even pregnancy. Nano then suggests to the teacher to join the app to secretly monitor the students, with the ability to access user information and easily identify anyone behaving inappropriately. Miss Naruman, intrigued by Nano's proposal, agrees and creates an account with the username. She even starts a conversation with another user. At that moment, Miss Naruman suddenly reminisced about her old best friend. They were very close, but there was one habit of her friends that she couldn't stand. Whenever she got into a relationship, she would lessen her communication with Narumon. Reflecting on this, another rule was added at the school. Any boy or girl caught alone together would face the most severe punishment for breaking the rules. For a while, Miss Narumon secretly monitored the students through the software, confiscating phones if she spotted anything amiss. Afterward, Miss Naruemon accidentally comes across a boy and girl walking together and immediately decrees that boys and girls are not allowed to walk down the same corridor. At this point, Miss Naruemon was nearly out of her mind with obsession, and Nano approached her, reporting that some of the chats were so flirtatious they made her blush. She even asked Miss Naruemon how she felt about those conversations. Miss Naruemon responded that she would stamp out everything that should not exist. Just then, Nano suddenly mentioned that there were sounds coming from a classroom. When Miss Naruman entered, she witnessed a scene she could never accept. The shy girl appeared to be doing something fishy and smelly on the ground. In the next second, after being hit by Miss Naruman, the boy fled with another student. This left Miss Naruman enraged, and memories flashed through her mind. Her best friend had passed away due to complications from getting rid of her pregnancy. After her friend's departure, Naruemon cried bitterly and lost all hope in men. Later, the principal calls Miss Naruemon into the office and fires her for hitting a student. It turns out that the shy girl was simply squatting down to pick something up. That evening, Miss Naruemon sat at home, her face ashen. The only company she had was her anonymous chat friend, who had become the only source of warmth she could feel. The next day, in front of all the students, the principal announced Miss Naruman's resignation without mentioning the dismissal. Taking the microphone, Miss Naruman spoke her truth. She urged the female students to preserve their virtue. At that moment, Nano pulled out her phone and started tapping away furiously. Suddenly, the anonymity feature on the chat app disappeared, revealing everyone's identity. Everyone found the person they had been regularly chatting with. Miss Naruman checked her phone, too, and discovered that the person she'd been talking to in the group chat was actually her colleague, the assistant teacher. With no more secrets to keep, the assistant teacher approached Miss Naruman and confessed her feelings. Miss Naruman pushed her heavy body away, exclaiming that they are both women, to which the assistant teacher responded that gender didn't matter. In a daze, Miss Naruamon thought she saw her deceased best friend encouraging her, telling her not to restrain herself anymore. The students watched this unfold with excitement. Finally, Nano walked away, ready to transfer to another school. As she received a message on her chat app, a girl with a red ribbon in her hair brushed past her, indicating something fishy is to come. The third episode begins with Nano now finding herself in a country with a vast disparity between the rich and the poor. The poor lived worse than stray dogs, while the rich did whatever they pleased. 
When it came to making mistakes, the more money the rich had, the lighter the punishment they received. The courts judged based on wealth. The scene shifts to a school office where a father and daughter were sitting before the principal. The girl's name was Minnie. The principal accused her of cheating on an exam and had called her father. Watching Minnie adamantly deny the accusations, her father slapped her and then offered to donate one million to the school if they let Minnie off by having her clean the toilets instead. The matter seemed to be settled. Leaving the office, the father began to scold Minnie again. Minnie felt the principal had no evidence or reason to punish her, but her father knew all too well that his daughter had always been a liar and stubbornly refused to admit fault. So he confiscated her car and grounded her for a month. Minnie, in the throes of teenage rebellion, didn't care about the restrictions and sneaked out to go joyriding and drinking while video calling her friends. She speculated that it might have been her deskmate who reported her for cheating because she had copied her deskmate's paper and only her deskmate knew. The more Minnie thought about it, the angrier she got. She floored the accelerator and then a car accident happened. When she woke up, Minnie found herself lying among the deceased, her defiant eyes now filled with panic and endless regret. The scene shifts to the aftermath of a car accident. There's a bustle of activity as people move about the site. Minnie had crashed into a school minibus, which was carrying four girls, including her deskmate and Nano. Reporters interviewed Minnie's father, eager to find out if Minnie had been driving under the influence, but he didn't say a word and left. Once home, the father resumed scolding Minnie, a routine following each of her mistakes. However, this time Minnie's expression wasn't as defiant, though she still spoke firmly, claiming the accident was caused by brake failure. The father didn't believe a word of Minnie's explanation. Gently, Minnie's mother sided with her, supporting her story. The father was speechless. It was he who had removed the bottles of alcohol from Minnie's car, otherwise the police would have taken her away by now. The father told Minnie to keep quiet. The next day, back at school, Minnie was met with a flurry of whispers and looks. In a state of panic, she entered the classroom to find that even her closest friend seemed to be avoiding her. On her desk, someone had placed a black and white photo of Nano and a bouquet of flowers. Fear gripped Minnie. Meanwhile, the father started to spread outrageous lies. He appeared on television, explaining that the car accident was due to brake failure. He also claimed that Minnie had been allergic to alcohol since she was a child. Her classmates were nearly sick of hearing it, as they all knew Minnie could hold her liquor well. Although Minnie was often dishonest, she wasn't shameless. Flustered, she ran to the restroom and found herself confronted with a multitude of hateful messages. That evening, Minnie's family dined together, seemingly in high spirits, as the TV reported an interview with the deskmate's parents. They looked impoverished and were clearly heartbroken, as Minnie's family hadn't even offered an apology. Minnie felt the stirrings of a guilty conscience, but the father remained oblivious to any wrongdoing. He had a lawyer draft a statement for Minnie to memorize, in which they would pin the blame on the minibus driver. Minnie refused. She felt she couldn't lie. Hearing his daughter's words, the man was dumbfounded. Indeed, Minnie was an expert at lying. The same girl who couldn't memorize a few English words had effortlessly learned the entire statement. That day, Minnie walked out of the courtroom feeling light and unburdened. Suddenly, a wine bottle rolled towards her feet. Voices from the crowd questioned whether she had really been driving under the alcohol influence. A woman with a red headband quickly left the scene. Seizing the moment, reporters bombarded Minnie with questions. Overwhelmed, she panicked. Her father swiftly escorted her away as an angry crowd began to hurl garbage at them. Back at home, Minnie discovered she was being followed. Online polls sprang up, debating what kind of punishment she deserved. Disturbed by the twisted comments, she quickly threw her phone away. Now, under extreme mental duress, Minnie saw a bloodied figure in the mirror. She sought comfort from her best friend, wishing for things to return to how they used to be. She insisted to her friend that the crash was really due to brake failure. However, her friend, seeing a ghostly shadow behind Minnie, was terrified. It turned out she had been able to see the ghosts of those killed in the accident all along, which explained her aversion to Minnie. Her friend fled again, leaving Minnie even more frightened as she too began to sense someone's presence. Meanwhile, the girl with the red headband was making a deal with Minnie's father. She handed over evidence of Minnie's guilt. The second trial concluded swiftly, with the father agreeing to a settlement of 300000 for each victim's family. It was a stark contrast to the one million could produce to cover up Minnie's cheating on an exam. The paltry sum for human lives underscored the tragedy of the poor. Outside the courthouse, Minnie saw a murderous look in the eyes of her deskmate's parents, a look that spoke of the powerlessness inherent to their social station. She couldn't shake off the fear, even in her car. 
Then the driver ahead yelled that his brakes had failed, and she experienced an accident herself. The scene shifted to Minnie going back to the night she drove under the influence. Nano, covered in blood, sat in Minnie's car declaring the results of the online poll about her. Two people appeared and began to assault her. Nano announced the punishment for her. If she didn't press the brakes, they'd break her legs. If she told lies, they'd knock out her teeth. Terrified, Minnie broke down and woke up from the nightmare. This time, her deskmate's parents appeared, gripping her tightly. After waking up from another torturous dream, Minnie sighed with relief. However, looking out the window, she saw her deskmate's parents just standing there, which sent her into a panic. She ran to her father, clinging to him. But her nightmare was only beginning. The top voter on the online poll, which called for her death, was actually her most trusted father. Despairing, Minnie woke up again, this time back in reality, barely alive on her bed. Nano appeared, telling Minnie that had she admitted her mistakes earlier, things wouldn't have come to this. Then she quietly left. Nano gone, the girl with the red headband showed up. She turned on the hospital room TV, which was broadcasting news about the case. New evidence had been found, photos of Minnie drinking and speeding. Additionally, there was an audio recording of Minnie's father dealing with the red headband girl about the evidence. The girl told Minnie that no one could help her now. The only way out was death. She eerily guided Minnie towards this fate. Downstairs, as Nano was preparing to leave, she heard a loud noise of Minnie dropping herself to death and a sultry voice behind her. Nano, smiling, greeted the girl who appeared. It turned out the girl with the red headband was named Yuri, one of the four people Minnie had killed, a mysterious presence who had appeared in previous episodes. Their eyes met, one devoid of desire, the other full of it. It seemed that Yuri's identity was not simple, especially compared to the mysterious girl Nano. The fourth episode begins with Yuri, whose eyes don't yet hold so much desire this time. Yuri is an average girl from an average family who often chooses to endure when faced with difficulties. One day, she received unexpected help from two bully girls. Yuri, not often touched by kindness, immediately smiled in gratitude. Together, they walked to the lockers, where the bully leader gifted Yuri a beautiful bag. As soon as Yuri took the bag in hand, someone sneered at her, insinuating she was a beggar. The bully leader didn't hesitate to chase off the mocker with a few choice words. At that moment, a beautiful girl watched everything unfold. It was Nano. The scene shifts to Yuri and the two girls back in class. The bully leader attempted to oust Nano from her adjacent seat, but Nano showed no discomfort at their brazen behavior. Instead, she envied the trio's friendship. Yuri, witnessing this, felt a pang of sympathy, her expression turning awkward. Seeing Nano's envy, the two bully girls proclaimed that if Nano could impress them, she could join their group. Nano agreed without a second thought. On the day of a school exam, Nano wrote cheat notes intending to pass them to the bully leader who refused Nano's gesture. Rejected, Nano swallowed the notes. At lunchtime, Nano explained her actions were well-intentioned, but the two bully girls criticized her approach, suggesting a different method was needed. They then performed a show of wealth, brandishing banknotes and instructing Yuri to fetch their lunch, effectively treating her as an errand girl. Nano watched Yuri's retreating figure with a hint of amusement in her eyes. The food was bought quickly, but they began to fuss, being picky eaters. Yuri ran back and forth several times to satisfy their demands. When it was finally time to eat, the bully leader dumped the unwanted food onto Yuri's plate. Yuri ate silently, a trace of resentment in her eyes. After the meal, Nano followed them, and they strutted around like bullies everyone feared. A girl saw them and quickly ran away. Nano asked what horrific thing they had done to instill such fear. It turned out the girl was embroiled in a scandal with the bully leader's boyfriend, and Yuri had ridiculed the girl online, leaving a bitter memory in her life. Shortly after, the group sat down to discuss the recent exam. The bully leader realized that her answer for one question was different from everyone else's, and suggested that Yuri should go change her answer sheet. This was a serious violation of school rules. Perhaps sensing Yuri's reluctance, Nano volunteered to dash to the office and surreptitiously altered the bully leader's paper. Those outside were impressed by Nano. After this incident, Nano asked the bully leader again if she could join their group. The bully leader didn't explicitly agree or disagree, but gave her a smile. Yuri left them with a complex expression. On her way home, Yuri clutched a new smartphone. Suddenly, Nano appeared in front of her and questioned why Yuri would stoop to being a lackey for those two. Yuri said they were friends. Nano exposed Yuri, revealing that she received a fee after altering the exam paper. Given all the tasks Yuri had done for them, she must have received a substantial amount of money. It seemed Yuri was driven by money, and her reluctant expressions were just a facade for wanting more. Nano didn't say much, just followed Yuri home. 
Yuri's home was modest, and her mother was working overtime. Yuri handed the new smartphone to her mother, claiming she earned it from tutoring. She also showed her mother how to use the entertainment features on the phone. Nano, witnessing all this, seemed to understand something. The scene shifts, and Yuri is walking with Nano. Yuri, although living there, dislikes the place immensely, as it reeks of poverty. She often imagines herself as wealthy, with the two bully girls as her lackeys. After hearing this, Nano suggests that having leverage over them would make it easy to command them. This gave Yuri an idea. She knew the bully leader had a computer with secrets on it that she let no one touch. But for Nano, that was no issue. She was almost like a deity that knows everything. One day, they were all at the bully leader's house for a party. Nano deliberately spilled water on the bully leader, then offered to fetch her some clothes. Yuri and Nano exchanged smiles, and then Nano entered the bully leader's room. She found the computer and saw many files, each named after a classmate, filled with unspeakable secrets and videos, even one with Yuri's name. Just as she opened Yuri's file, someone appeared and knocked her out. Later, Nano awakens with an expression of terror on her face, deserving full marks for her performance. In the dimly lit room, a camera is set up, with Yuri and the two bully girls standing before her. This was all part of a well-laid plan aimed at setting up Nano. Yuri apologizes to Nano, but the bully leader insists Yuri did the right thing, claiming a lackey must look the part, and Nano is clearly not cut out for it. Upon hearing these words, the fear on Nano's face fades, replaced by a smile. She's seen too much darkness, aware that the bully leader intends to have men harm her, capture it on video, and then use it to blackmail her. Nano reveals to the trio that she's already uploaded the files from her computer to the internet, poised to expose their misdeeds. Faced with Nano's defiance, the bully leader is enraged and orders Yuri to find a way to silence Nano. Watching Nano laughing hysterically, Yuri is too afraid to make a move, so the two bully girls take matters into their own hands, with Yuri documenting everything. It turns out Yuri had been looking for a chance to turn the tables, and with Nano's arrival, she saw her opportunity. Then, two men appear. They are Yuri's reinforcements. Empowered, Yuri's demeanor becomes arrogant. She commands the two girls to stage Nano's death as an accident and starts negotiating with the men over the price to cover up the murder, the bids getting higher until they reach 10 million. But Yuri no longer cares for money. She's been wronged by these two before and seeks revenge. The two men pounce, and the camera captures scenes too disturbing to describe. A triumphant Yuri boasts of her success to the lifeless Nano. But in the next moment, the tables unexpectedly turn again, as the two men Yuri brought in turn against her, and all the girls fall victim to this deadly game. After another quick transition, the men leave, and Nano comes to, unbothered as if dying were just part of her routine. As she exits the basement, the supposedly dead Yuri suddenly opens her eyes, the fifth episode begins with Nano arriving at her new school, where she encountered the somewhat sleazy-looking man who happened to be the student council president, Kay. He was in the midst of hosting a welcoming ceremony for the newcomers, a unique tradition of this institution. The students were curious and eager to partake, but they soon regretted their enthusiasm. Unspeakable items were forced into the mouths of the newcomers, who ended up retching on the ground while the student council members watched on with satisfied grins. For the freshmen, the nightmare was just beginning, as the school's motto was terrifying. You may ignore the presence of God, but you must grovel before your seniors. No one had yet dared to revolt against this until now, emboldening Kay and his crew. They singled out a shy girl to dance an embarrassing dance. Too reserved, she couldn't bring herself to do it, prompting Kay to come up with a new degrading idea called the Human Centipede, making the freshmen kneel on the ground, head to buttocks. This was too humiliating for Nano to bear. She stood up and declared Kay a criminal. Unfazed, he arrogantly challenged the other students, asking if anyone supported Nano's claim. Another girl stood up. It was Yuri, who miraculously revived after being drowned previously. Nano and Yuri stood face to face, with Yuri thanking Nano for the strength that brought her back to life and promising to learn from Nano's way of handling things. Then they performed a forbidden dance together, a hauntingly beautiful routine that left an indescribable impression. Back in the present, Kay was taken aback that someone had the courage to stand with Nano. He insisted that here, one must listen to their seniors unconditionally or face punishment. He ordered both girls to remove their tops. Nano complied and Yuri followed suit. Both revealed their attractive figures, which stirred Kay's perverse nature. He then commanded all the new students to do the same and took out his phone to capture the moment for posterity. Sometime later, after school was dismissed, the principal approached Kay with a video showing his torment of the new students. 
Kay argued it was because they were disobedient, but the principal wasn't angry. He simply warned Kay to be careful not to let the video spread outside the school, as it could tarnish the school's reputation. Nano and Yuri met, and it turned out that the video was leaked by Yuri. Yuri said she was imitating Nano and hoped that Nano would not stop her. Nano didn't say much. The next day, Kay gathered the freshmen again and brought up the issue of someone secretly filming a video, leading to everyone's phones being confiscated. Suddenly, Nano tapped on her phone, and everyone received a shocking video showing Kay being severely bullied, an event from his early days at the school. Enraged, Kay saw Nano smiling broadly and confronted her, asking if she was behind it. Nano calmly admitted to it and explained that Kay's tormenting of the freshmen was a form of revenge for his own past experiences. Nano had sharply poked at Kay's deep-seated sense of inferiority, causing him to punish all the new students except for her. The freshmen quickly became exhausted and sweaty, but Nano seemed unaffected. Kay, nearly bursting with anger, tied balloons all over Nano and had people blindfolded, swinging baseball bats to pop them. However, Nano's laughter was too much for Kay to bear. He grabbed a bat and smashed it into Nano's face, knocking out several of her teeth and eyes. The incident was serious, but the principal still managed to cover it up for Kay because of his influential father. Kay could no longer stay at the school. The scene shifts to Kay at a new school, attending a ceremony for new students. When he looked up and saw the revived Nano, he was stunned. Nano watched Kay with a smile, and the next second she falsely accused him of touching her behind in front of everyone. Kay tried to prove his innocence, but no one believed him. The school's motto was the same as his previous one. The words of the seniors are the law. If freshmen are called dogs, they must bark. The seniors pinned Kay down with one ready to smash his manhood with a rock. To protect his fertility, Kay was forced to confess and did so, urinating in his pants from fright. Kay's ordeal was just beginning. At the following welcoming ceremony, Nano promoted a rule of gender equality and then had the male and female freshmen exchange clothes. Most were happy to comply, and some even enjoyed it. Kay reluctantly entered the changing room, and after a long time, everyone realized he had run away. In his frantic escape, Yuri suddenly appeared and scared him to the ground. But when he got up, Yuri had disappeared. The seniors caught up and took Kay back. The camera pans to Kay, who emerges dressed in new clothes. Kay's outfit is undoubtedly the highlight of the day. Although it has garnered everyone's attention, Kay's mentality has exploded. The deep-seated inferiority within him has always made him guard his self-esteem carefully, but now it has been trampled to the point of worthlessness. Finally, the gender equality game has ended, and the unity game has begun. Since Kay was injured during his escape and couldn't be punished, someone else had to take the punishment for him. With complicated feelings, Kay watched as the freshmen were tortured, many casting resentful glances his way. He was destined to have a difficult time at this school. At the end of the welcoming activities, the freshmen had to sincerely thank the upperclassmen and bow to them. Everyone did so properly, but when it came to Kay's turn, his object of thanks became a dog. Nano had a reason for this. She said that whoever has been at the school longer is the senior. This dog had been at the school longer than Kay, so it was considered his senior. Reluctantly, Kay bowed his head to the dog. That evening, the freshmen surrounded Kay, warning him not to go against the words of the upperclassmen again, and they chased him outside. Holding in his anger, Kay lashed out at the dog. Just then, Nano appeared, released the dog, and shouted at Kay, accusing him of wanting to kill the dog. The freshmen were tormented another whole night searching for the dog, but it was nowhere to be found. Nano suggested finding someone among the freshmen to take the dog's place. All eyes turned to Kay. He was made to wear a collar and go through what a dog would, eventually being locked in the cage the dog once occupied. As Kay struggled, Yuri appeared and set him free. Nano criticized Yuri's actions, but Yuri argued that her methods were faster and more effective. Yuri then raised her voice, announcing that Kay had run away. Another all-nighter ensued. Last time it was a dog hunt, this time it was a manhunt. Kay hid like a stray dog, eventually taking refuge on top of a car. The car slowly drove away and Kay, thinking he was saved, began to laugh crazily. However, when he reached the destination, he was stunned. The car had driven back to the school. After a whole night of turmoil, he was back where he started. Kay had no choice but to keep running, but he was quickly discovered and had to jump into the water. That's when Yuri appeared, holding the body of the dog, claiming Kay had killed it. Kay frantically tried to explain, but no one believed him. Yuri told Nano that if Kay were set free, he would continue to do evil deeds and should be dealt with permanently. Nano felt pity for the wrongly killed dog, saying that Yuri's methods only addressed the symptoms, not the root cause. 
Yuri countered, saying if Nano continued to be soft-hearted, she would take her place. Hearing the threat, Nano calmly walked away. Meanwhile, the students began to attack Kay. As he looked at these malicious people, he was reminded of his own once malicious self. The sixth episode begins with a voiceover from Nano. This time, her story revolves around rules. Rules are meant to serve the public interest, yet often those who create them fail to abide by them, placing themselves above the law. The masses are tormented by these so-called rules. On this occasion, Nano finds herself at a new school with a clear objective in mind to overturn the so-called school regulations. She pushes open the school's grand doors and steps inside. In an instant, the scale of the frame changes and the world turns to shades of gray and white. Nano enters her new classroom where the students greet her with their warmest smiles, though their expressions seem insincere. Unperturbed by the falsity, Nano calmly walks to her seat and even tries to greet the girl next to her, who completely ignores her. After a while, when the teacher's attention shifts, the kind-hearted girl stealthily starts a conversation with Nano and introduces herself. Suddenly, Nano's lipstick falls to the ground. The kind-hearted girl quickly picks it up and hands it back to Nano. At the same time, the homeroom teacher begins to lead the student council in inspecting the students' backpacks. Watching this, Nano's previously calm demeanor turns to panic as she clutches her bag tightly. Sure enough, Nano's bag is selected for inspection. Nano feigns distress, claiming her personal privacy is being invaded, but the homeroom teacher retorts assertively, saying that children have no privacy to speak of. As she rummages through Nano's bag and lectures her about obeying the teachers as their word is absolute authority, she finds nothing incriminating. The homeroom teacher eventually walks away, defeated. The once aggrieved Nano's face breaks into a familiar smile. She takes out the hidden lipstick and applies it, bringing a bright splash of red to the gray and white world. At lunchtime, the cafeteria was playing an educational video from the principal. The gist of the message was that the school's renowned reputation over the years was all thanks to its strict rules. Therefore, the students must commit these rules to memory. Nano, however, was dismissive of these words. The kind-hearted girl, looking at the rebellious Nano, warned her that the school particularly liked to discipline rebellious students, who usually ended up with terrible fates. Just a few days ago, during class, a submissive student had pointed out a mistake made by the teacher and was rewarded with the kiss of a blackboard eraser to the head, which left her bleeding. Another student caught the incident on camera. Upon discovering this, the teacher sent both to the isolation room for repentance, and they hadn't been seen since. Clearly frightened, the kind-hearted girl cautioned Nano against getting herself thrown into that dreaded room where life was worse than death. No sooner had she finished speaking than the homeroom teacher, accompanied by her cronies, conducted a surprise inspection. Nano, who had applied lipstick, was caught red-handed. The homeroom teacher smeared Nano's lipstick across her face, confiscated it, and then ordered her to recite all 427 school rules without a single mistake. But that wasn't enough. The homeroom teacher also had Nano recite the rules in the scorching sun in front of all the students on the playground. Nano, the mischievous genius, turned the rule recitation into a spectacle, drawing the attention of all the students. Then she burst into laughter, finding the rules utterly ridiculous. The student monitor standing by thought about stopping her but took no action, since the rules didn't explicitly forbid laughing at them. Unsure of what to do, they called for the homeroom teacher. Nano, deciding to go all in, set the rule book ablaze and confidently told the homeroom teacher that there was no rule against burning the rule book. This infuriated the homeroom teacher to the point of nearly bursting a blood vessel. Unsurprisingly, Nano ended up in the isolation room. Before she was locked away, the homeroom teacher asked two students if they understood their mistakes in front of Nano. The submissive student quickly admitted her fault, but the rebellious student remained defiant, failing to see the wrong in recording the truth, and even suggested transferring schools as a last resort. Upon hearing this, the homeroom teacher threatened to blacklist the rebellious student and send his name to all schools, ensuring that he would be unable to attend school or even get a job, effectively ruining his life. Hearing this, the rebellious student finally gave in, realizing that the homeroom teacher's threats were serious. The scene shifts to Nano, who has been locked away in the isolation room. Next to her, two loudspeakers were set up, endlessly looping the school rules, a common brainwashing tactic used by the school. But Nano wasn't having any of it. 
Meanwhile, the homeroom teacher was caught in a daze with Nano's lipstick in her hand, musing over the thought that no woman could resist such a thing. Suddenly, the student council burst in, reporting an incident in the classroom. Nano had somehow appeared in the class, sporting a green headband. Feeling provoked, the homeroom teacher planted cigarettes in Nano's pocket and blatantly framed her for smoking. She locked her back in the isolation room and tormented her with a spotlight. But Nano wasn't afraid of death, let alone these childish tactics. The next day, Nano showed up in the classroom again, this time with her hair dyed purple and sporting multiple tongue studs and rings. Under her influence, all the students laughed heartily. The homeroom teacher was now completely enraged, and Nano was dragged away once more. This time, the homeroom teacher attempted to negotiate, asking Nano what she really wanted. Nano demanded that the homeroom teacher apologize to the students whose lives she had ruined. Back in her office, the homeroom teacher frantically smeared Nano's lipstick on, giving the impression of a senile old woman. Then another girl appeared. It was Yuri. She volunteered to run for student council president, claiming she understood Nano well enough to handle her. She also reported classmates who were planning to cause trouble, leading to many being apprehended. Yuri quickly gained the homeroom teacher's trust. She seized the opportunity to sneak into the office and search through her documents, finding something that made her smile. As the scene shifts, the documents appear before Nano. Nano inquires what Yuri intends to do. With a smile, Yuri responds, nothing at all. On the other side, the principal lectures the apprehended students, threatening to end them if they don't obey. The students submit. Meanwhile, the homeroom teacher is negotiating with Nano. The documents Nano holds could expose the teacher's hypocrisy. The homeroom teacher makes a grab for them, but Yuri, on the side, secretly records the scuffle with her phone and then shows up beside Nano, pushing her over. Blood splatters on a boy's ice cream. Upstairs, Yuri threatens the homeroom teacher to hand over the documents or she'll frame her for murder. She complies. Yuri looks through the documents and uncovers the school's truth. Funds meant for the school are embezzled by some. The homeroom teacher denies everything, so Yuri scatters the documents in the air, revealing the truth to all the students, along with the video of the homeroom teacher's supposed act of murder. This ignites a deep-seated rage within the students, who begin to hunt down the homeroom teacher. Other teachers are caught too. Even the principal, planning to flee with the funds, doesn't make it out. Watching the chaos, Yuri walks with a confident stride, smiling. She takes charge of the students' actions, demanding the teachers write confessions. The homeroom teacher refuses to comply, which greatly annoys the rebellious student who attacks the homeroom teacher, and in the scuffle, the homeroom teacher meets her demise. People panic, with most looking to shift the blame onto the rebellious student. At that moment, the principal, wielding a handgun from above, reminds everyone that power comes from the barrel of a gun. He regains the support of many students and takes control of the situation. Yuri is captured, and under the principal's directive, the students all point fingers at her as the culprit. The principal smiles with satisfaction and orders the rebellious student to eliminate Yuri. Suddenly, the school loses power. Multiple nanos appear, emboldening the students to resist once more. Teachers even start to livestream the event. Finally, the principal is overpowered. Yuri is captured again. Nano criticizes Yuri for being too radical and locks her in with the teachers, leaving them to fight amongst themselves, with only a few survivors. In the end, Nano hands the key to the kind-hearted girl, and a sealed door is opened. The students are free, and Yuri emerges covered in blood. Unexpectedly, the world outside remains in shades of gray. The seventh episode begins with Jane, who is a sweet and innocent student, and beyond that, she's also a sweet live streamer. Jane's parents are not only supportive, but actively help her with her streaming. For this family, the most important part of their day is how many people tune in to the live stream. However, they sometimes feel helpless, especially when a big news story breaks and their viewership declines rapidly. But Jane has her loyal fans, one of whom always stays until the end of every broadcast. The problem is that there are too few of these devoted fans. Jane desperately needs a large online audience so she can attract advertisers. At some point, this family began to pursue fame and fortune for its own sake. Jane is also a genuinely nice person in her everyday life. She greets her classmates, even those she doesn't know well, and can casually recall their names, giving off a vibe of warm familiarity. The scene shifts to Nano transferring to Jane's school and immediately behaving like an enthusiastic fan. She claims to be a fan of Jane, even reciting lines from Jane's streams by heart. This earns her Jane's trust quite quickly, a part of Nano's initial plan. Seeing Jane's friendly demeanor, Nano asks if they could swap seats. Jane is reluctant but agrees, not wanting to upset Nano. 
Eventually, Nano continues to bond with Jane, sharing that she has watched Jane's streams for a long time. She candidly tells Jane that she can talk about anything that's bothering her and show her true self in Nano's presence. Nano's words are sincere, and Jane begins to be swayed. She has been hiding her true self for too long. Jane then suggests switching the seats back, to which Nano happily agrees. For the first time, Jane experiences the benefits of expressing her genuine thoughts. During lunch, a classmate stopped Jane as she was passing by and suddenly asked her how much money she could make in a month. Jane felt embarrassed, but thankfully Nano was there to help her out of the situation. Jane once again felt a sense of dependency on Nano. She truly felt at ease with her, but this was just the beginning. Nano then started to encourage Jane to eat whatever she wanted, including the delicious foods that would make her gain weight, foods that her parents strictly forbade her to eat because they wouldn't look good on camera. Jane once again experienced the pleasure of taste. After the meal, Nano told Jane that her advertisements were not heartfelt. Jane felt helpless. She wanted to be more meticulous, but her parents disagreed. They were only interested in the money from the advertisers and would find ways to cope without caring about the product quality or Jane's well-being. Sometimes, Jane had to livestream and sell products while exhausted in the middle of the night, pretending to be cheerful. One time, Jane overheard her parents discussing a birthday gift for her. She was about to be happy about it until she heard their choice of gift. They were planning to buy her followers so they could charge more for advertisements. After talking about her parents, Jane mentioned her online followers. Because her online persona was too friendly, many trolls didn't take it well and attacked her with malicious language. After venting, Jane expressed her desire to completely give up her online persona. Upon hearing this, Nano suggested that Jane fake her own death. Jane thought it was a good plan. Jane's mother watched her daughter live streaming. But after a while, she rushed upstairs because Jane was saying inappropriate things, insulting the advertisers, and revealing her true self. Her parents couldn't enter the room from outside, and just as they were using the key to open the door, a major bombshell dropped in the live stream. Jane told the camera that her parents treated her like a cash cow, solely driven by profit. And so, the parents became the target of public criticism. Finally, when the parents opened the door, there was nobody inside. Their daughter was gone. The police were called, but in the live stream room, Jane had already died. In fact, it was all planned. The room was a replica of Jane's room created by Nano. The original Jane had died, and the current Jane was a wild, sexy Jane with a mischievous smile, a nose ring, and wearing much less fabric. At that moment, Jane's parents were apologizing on TV. Jane couldn't care less. She was only worried about being recognized, but she was overthinking it. No one knew who she was. In the hotel room, Nano pulled out her phone. That's when an unwanted person appeared. It was Yuri who had found the fake streaming room and exposed Jane's fake death. She even claimed to be Jane's best friend. Jane was furious. She didn't even know this person. To make matters worse, Yuri started her own live stream, promising to unveil the truth. Nano watched all this, a meaningful smile playing across her face. Meanwhile, Yuri was live, unearthing lots of evidence, and her live stream's audience numbers were skyrocketing. The more Jane watched, the angrier she got. Then the phone rang. It was Yuri calling Jane, and they agreed to meet up. As soon as they met, Yuri accused Nano of being a bad influence. She claimed it was because of Nano that she was able to expose Jane's lies. After saying this, Yuri also deleted the evidence from her phone. Back at the hotel, Jane told Nano she regretted everything and wanted to go home. Nano just laughed, mocking Jane for even missing parents like hers. Jane's expression turned fierce. That night, she secretly used Nano's phone to access Yuri's live stream and discovered that Yuri had revealed evidence of her and Nano together, claiming that Nano had instigated everything. Yuri announced that the police were on their way. In a panic, Jane was about to lose her composure when Nano woke up. Jane found the courage to say she wanted to go home. Nano responded that Jane could leave if she killed her. Later, Jane and Yuri were connected on a live stream, both appearing bloody. Jane lied, saying Nano had kidnapped her and that she had managed to kill Nano and escape. But the comments were saying this Jane was fake. At the same time, the indestructible Nano started her own stream. Everyone believed Nano was the real Jane, and even the family photos at Jane's home had changed to Nano's likeness. Feeling helpless, Jane returned home to find Nano getting along well with her parents. Jane burst in to prove her identity and listed many faults of her parents, like not letting her eat delicious food. 
but her mother pointed at Nano and said they didn't allow it because her daughter is allergic to those things and supported her daughter's live streaming because she had always wanted to be a star since she was young. Jane tearfully asked her parents if they truly didn't recognize her, while Nano looked on emotionlessly, mocking her. Seeing Nano's expression, Jane was about to explode with anger. She lashed out at Nano, but was held back by her parents. In their eyes, Jane was a kidnapper who had framed Nano. But now, their identities had been switched, and all of this was broadcast live by Nano. She then had her parents call the police, and Jane was arrested. In desperation, Jane demanded to know from Nano what she had done to deserve all this, before breaking free from the police and running away. In the end, Yuri stood by Nano's side. Nano mocked Yuri for still being so naive, but Yuri was actually happy because she saw the wound on Nano's neck. She knew Nano couldn't answer Jane's question, so the wound didn't heal immediately. Nano's resolve was weakening, and the price for her was becoming mortal. After saying all this, Yuri left happily while Nano touched her wound, a rare look of confusion in her eyes. The eighth episode begins with a recap of some scenes from the previous seven episodes. These stories all share a common thread. The rules are set by those in power. But who should determine the rules of the upper echelons? And who should carry out the punishments? The scene shifts to Nano on the ground, looking as if she's on the brink of death. A woman with an indistinct face is swinging a butcher's knife above her. In another scene, Nano follows the old routine and transfers to a new school. The only difference is, the wound on her neck hasn't healed yet. There's a photo of a girl on the school's wall of honor named Junko. After glancing at it, Nano walks away, seemingly identifying her as her next target. Not far off, Nano encounters Yuri, who is in a wheelchair. Nano then recalls the last time they met, when Yuri mocked her for losing her immortality. Suddenly, someone calls out Junko's name and snaps Nano back to reality. She then sees the one in the wheelchair is Junko. Nano greets her, expressing admiration for her many awards. Junko humbly admits that since she's disabled and can't play outside, she finds her sense of existence in studying. During their conversation, Junko accidentally cuts her hand, and a classmate quickly wheels her to the infirmary. It turns out Junko has a strange illness where her bleeding won't stop. To care for her, Junko's mother took a job at the school's infirmary for convenience. Nano sympathizes with Junko, but a classmate suggests that if she really cares, she should donate money online. Junko's condition is shared online, and many people contribute to her medical expenses. The only downside is the competitive comments that arise with donations, where people get criticized for donating too little. The scene then cuts to Nano watching the happy mother and daughter. The mother gently reminds Junko to be careful outside. When the mother notices Nano, their eyes meet. In Nano's mind flashes the scene of her being killed, and the blurred woman is revealed to be Junko's mother. She greets Nano warmly. Nano enthusiastically responds, saying she's a new transfer student who wants to be friends and take care of Junko. The mother declines, saying she gives Junko injections every day and proceeds to inject her daughter with practiced ease, like a seasoned head nurse. Nano watches this, muttering, how pitiful. The mother picks up the conversation, intending to agree about her daughter's plight, but Nano retorts that it's Junko's mother who is pitiable, having spent a lifetime caring for her daughter, who won't be able to care for her in return. The mother calmly states she doesn't mind, she just wants Junko to grow up healthy. She walks away with Junko. Nano picks up a medicine bottle, sniffing it with a somewhat playful expression. In the evening, the mother prepared a lavish dinner for Junko and, as usual, gave her an injection after the meal. Later, the mother went to a dimly lit cabin where she bought a large bag of salt and used it to bury something unknown. This cabin was the mother's secret place, off-limits to everyone. After she left, the light inside the cabin turned on again. It's Nano who had stealthily entered. The next day in the infirmary, the mother noticed a shadowy figure, but when she pulled back the curtain, there was no one there. Suddenly, Nano appeared before her and inquired about the previous doctor and her whereabouts. The mother replied that she didn't know that doctor well and had no information. Nano continued to ask about several teachers who had mysteriously disappeared, to which the mother replied that she didn't know. Nano stared at her and asked if those missing people might have gone to a place that was damp and very salty. The mother instantly thought of her cabin and became slightly panicked. However, Nano suggested that they might have gone to the seaside. Before leaving, Nano handed her a medicine bottle and stated that it wasn't the medication for treating Junko's condition. The mother turned even more fearful. That day, Junko was brought to the infirmary injured again. 
The mother took meticulous care of her, but strangely, even as Junko was unconscious, her mother seemed very at ease. Suddenly, her phone rang. It was a photo from Nano, revealing the secret inside the mother's cabin. It turned out that the missing teachers from the school were dead, their bodies buried by the mother in the cabin, and the salt was used to prevent decay. After sending the photo, Nano was in high spirits, and Yuri appeared at just the right moment. As usual, Yuri discussed morality with Nano, saying that bad people should be dealt with directly. There seemed to be a strange connection between Yuri and Nano. Nano had dreamt of being killed by Junko's mother, and Yuri could sense that vision too. Nano's phone rang. It was the mother asking to meet. Nano arrived on time and confronted her about the murders. Nano suggested that Junko's condition never improved because she had been injecting her daughter with a special drug to fraudulently solicit donations. Nano wanted to go public with this information. The mother tried to silence Nano but was blocked. With no other choice, the mother was forced to explain her actions. She said that she had been taking the donations to give to the families of the deceased teachers and kept Junko's condition unchanged as an act to save the world, claiming Junko was not a normal human. As soon as she finished speaking, Junko in the infirmary opened her eyes, her gaze eerily similar to Nano's. Moreover, she shared that Junko had been ridiculed and bullied from a young age, even by her teachers, which led to her developing a strong aversion to school and harboring resentment towards those people. Consequently, she delved into human anatomy and ended up killing those who had mocked her. When the mother discovered what her daughter had done, she felt obligated to cover up the aftermath. After all, it was her own child. To prevent Junko from harming anyone else, the mother resorted to administering a drug that weakened Junko, leaving her unable to act on her impulses. The lady considered herself the perfect mother, believing she had done nothing wrong. At that moment, Junko appeared. Standing behind her was Yuri. Junko had overheard her mother's words. Yuri, who had already found Junko and influenced her thinking, quickly stirred the pot. By now, both Yuri and Junko had become monstrous. Junko confronted her mother, asserting that her vengeance was justified, while the mother pleaded with her to return to the right path. However, Junko retorted that her version of justice was to exact revenge, and anyone who opposed her killings was corrupt. Meanwhile, Yuri was holding a bottle of medicine. It turned out she had switched Junko's medication. This meant that Junko's current state, confined to a wheelchair, was an act. Slowly, Junko stood up and lunged at her mother, stabbing her repeatedly. As the mother and daughter struggled, Nano asked Yuri why she would support even those who do wrong. Yuri responded ambiguously, suggesting that it wasn't clear who was in the right or wrong between Junko and her mother. The fight between mother and daughter came to a climax. The mother, unable to bring herself to harm Junko, hesitated. But Junko, full of malice, was determined to kill her mother. Nano intervened at the last moment, getting wounded by the knife in the process. Yuri was glad to watch Nano get hurt. Despite Nano's action, the mother was not grateful. She feared Nano would expose Junko's murderous deeds, so she chose to silence her. With relentless stabs, the fight came to an end. Ultimately, Yuri and Junko stood together, forming an alliance sealed in blood. Apparently, the mother met a grisly end at the hands of her beloved daughter, who fell into an extreme state of vengeance, becoming like Yuri. The story concludes with the two of them heading off to punish the wicked in their own ways. In the distance, the resurrected Nano watched them silently, contemplating her own existence. If people now had the power to punish evil and promote good, did she still need to exist? Whether it's Yuri or Nano, their methods of dealing with wrongdoers have their supporters. Despite being a deity, Nano is unable to find the ultimate right answer. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.